Okay, good morning. Um, it's an honor to be here, <laughs> to be the first presentation um, any so ever. Uh, I, today, uh, my topic would be institutionalizing game preservation, Homo Ludens Archive and its ecology niche in Chinese game industry. I'm Dr. Filania Liu from Beijing Normal University, also the founder of Homo Ludens Archive that I'm talking about. So uh, I have a relatively long um, presentation, so I'm trying to wrap it up as, as quickly as possible. There are a few videos that if, I don't, if I'm running out of time, I won't show it. And then if someone is interested, I'll show it afterwards. So basically, I think I'll start by uh, letting people revisit what is a game archive from the very start. And what purpose or function does it serve for the game industry? Because it appears to me that for the majority of game archives worldwide, there have been this Mobius loop that, um, yes, of course, a game archive is there to preserve a piece of history. But for whom? And for what functions does it serve uh, for the people outside the game industry? Because that's uh, it's something that I think would make game preservation sustainable and also uh, thriving. Uh, and I'm going to think that um, I, I won't spend a lot of time with those um, slides with that, that's full of text because you can all read it. So uh, today my, my, my topic would be more focused on we, if we revisit what archive is and if we come back to Michael Foucault and the archaeology of knowledge, Foucault did mention that, um, that, this, that the idea of archive is the set of discourses actually pronounced and the set of the discourse envisaged not only as a set of events which would have taken place once and for all and which would remain in abeyance in the limbo or purgatory of history, but also as a set that continues to function, to be transformed through history and to provide the possibility of appearing in other discourses. So today when I'm talking about the game archives, I don't want to stress that it only has the function of preserving history. History. What I really want to see is what functions would it also serve outside. So basically um, the focus and we would come to the game preservation conditions in China first. As uh, many of you are already aware that China has a booming game economy and currently the gaming population covers over half a billion uh, people. And we have female players, we have male players, and we have the largest game company in the entire world. So uh, that should um, be the scenario where game preservation is taking widely in place. But the truth is, it's not. Uh, the Chinese uh, government has a very weird attitude towards gaming, which I'm going to analyze from the cultural aspect in detail later. And in the meantime, ga game scholarship had never been really in full-fledged in China. And the game industry still follows the jungles rules, which means it's not a very um, ecological friendly environment and there is a serious lack of trust. Uh, the problem of the lack of trust is very essential for game preservation because if you are selling ticket to the normal people, then they need to have trust to the game knowledge that you provided them with. And they need to at least have this understanding that game is a cultural product that they can look up upon instead of uh, a pure entertainment that doesn't worth their time and money. Well, in the meantime, there, it, there is also a lack of trust among the industry players because the largest game company, Tencent, uh, had a reputation of very quickly uh, copycat what you did or just, just invest a vast amount of money and get your men out. And that resulted in the fact that um, the game creation techniques or uh, game development techniques had been done on a one-to-one-on-one -on -one basis. And people are very afraid to share that knowledge with the outside world. 
And that also resulted in the fact that um, the success of every game company in China had been um, with this coincidental cause that people don't know why they success. For example, Tencent produced the most successful mo MOBA game in China called Valor of Kings. And they failed to produce a second because they don't know what's right. And so on the basis of that, um, the uh, game preservation could be not only a piece of history, but also has its functions within this relatively developing game environment in China. And so uh, I was involved with game preservation since 2018. But before that, I was involved with the Chinese uh, indie game society when I was part of, uh, when I was also involved establishing Chinese Digra. Um, so I, I, I paid about five years uh, in pain and in vain in game scholarship environment building. And then I find out, um, I think the failure is partly because we don't have a proper Chinese game history so that the game researchers cannot work on it. While in the meantime, uh, we failed because we don't have a meaningful connection with the industry. So, uh, and how does the meaningful interaction happen in the industry? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm just like an anthropologist who, who just tell the world that I want to do game research since 2007. And then uh, the industry watches me and, and see what we can do together. And so it takes a lot of time and effort to build the trust. But then uh, in the end, we were very familiar with game collectors, game developers, indie games and indie game people, which are the most important one, which also help us to build the majority of our donation. So uh, on the basis of this, we uh, get to know almost all people that's concerning game preservation in China, as we are also the first one to start it, it non, um, on, on, on an NGO basis. So basically, there are four types of practices of game preservation in China. I won't go into details of each one, but each one is built by three, uh, two to three cases behind it. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to list these four types through two means. One is where does their money come from? And the other is uh, in China, their current condition. So in terms of game museum, I'm defining it as that they economically they receive a national fund or they have governmental support. And their um, income would come from ticket sales and peripheral product sales. And this type of thing is absent in the Chinese game landscape. We don't have game museums in China now. No, not a single one of them. But we do have a few game exhibitions. For example, Game On came to China in 2018, and that inspired people. So elite collector follow suits. So they have some private owned game museums that's opening to the public. But I'm not calling it game museums because it doesn't really have educational purpose. It, it cannot educate the public. Um, normally, this type of uh, elite collector museum is economically reliant on, their, on themselves. Normally, they would just have this hobby project and have this small sum of money and then rent a place and then just throw everything in to see what happens. And for example, the Chaka Museum right there in Hangzhou, uh, it used to be this case that they fully reliant on the self-subsidized and also ticket sales. And sometimes they would rent their venue to, uh, to business and that would also be some of the income, but it doesn't, the ends doesn't meet. So in the end, uh, Chaka went bankrupt and become part of Homo Luden's archive, uh, Hangzhou branch. And so it's a very weird story of elite collectors um, museum went into game archives. And then we have another mode of game shop that is run by commercial enterprise that actually sells games and peripherals. Because in China, we don't have GameStop. We don't have any commercial services like that. So if you want to buy a game, you have to go to very specific places, very specific game shops. And those game shops would receive commercial support from the console or game machine producers. For example, uh, the photo over there, Ji Ke Tang, is a Chengdu-based uh, <clears throat> uh, game shop. It also is calling itself uh, the Global Museum of Video Games. 
uh, yes, they, they are all calling themselves museums, but economically they're not. Uh, their, their major income, uh, with our interview with the, with the owner of the shop, their major income is still from selling games. So uh, basically, I think that defines them as a game shop. And um, they are more and more popular currently, and they also receive a donation from Sony because they, they also sell their machines. Uh, people would be willing to pay to see uh, some of their game machines, but they, they rarely host uh, commercial exhibitions. And of course, they don't have educational purpose. They became a very good place for players to meet. And then we have Game Archive, uh, that is basically us, that is based on a non-profit foundation support that's specifically collected for game preservation. And sometimes um, it also receives sub subsidization by a research fund. And uh, we are gradually popular in a very weird way where the collectors and game shops currently really love to use a Game Archive in their name even if they, they don't have the function of serving um, the industry. So I think we must be doing something right. And in terms of challenges, I listed very specifically, so I won't go into details. But basically, uh, from every aspect of challenge, I uh, inspect them through the government side, the public side, and the player and the industry side. We don't have game museum because we don't. Uh, the government doesn't recognize game as a proper form of cultural product. And um, from the public side, there is a very serious lack of game literacy among them, which means they have no trust for the game knowledge and they are not willing to pay for a game show. And um, also uh, from the player and industry side, uh, some players already owned enough game machines so they won't go to this type of exhibition or museum. And even if they do, um, they will only go once. So it still will not subsidize in the long run. And I already mentioned the story of Chaka and how the low level of game li literacy would result in the fact that they cannot develop sustainably. And in terms of the game shop, I think they are developing rather well uh, because the public is not against them. It's, it's just one of the game shop. Um, but from the, players, from the player side, they also have the very important function of fostering the local hub for player community to form. Players would come to game shops and, and to, to meet their friends and to play game together, which is a rare uh, opportunity to do that in public in China. But currently, we also have more game shops in malls that, that would rent you um, the game machine for uh, 15 to 20 RMB per hour. Uh, not not per, per hour, I think per 10 minutes. But it's still rather expensive, so it's not a place that you can hang around with your friend for the whole day. So in that sense, if we're talking about community building, then game shop is still one of the most important means, but there's not a lot of them. That, that is something I want to stress. There are only four related game preservation institutions in entire China now. So <laughs> we only have that in Chengdu. They used to be in Beijing, but then they moved. Uh, and from the industry side, sometimes they, they get industry support, like this one is fully supported by Sony. Um, but uh, they also have uh, game events and things like it. So their challenge, I don't know, uh, as long as they're selling the games, is fine. <clears throat> and um, then it comes to Game Archive, where from the government side, uh, local government are certainly interested, and they offer us free venue. But uh, the central government is also interested in the way that they think it's um, interesting to see how games can positively uh, influence the greater society. So from the public side, because we also have a bunch of exhibitions that, that I'm going to run through very quickly, so they are interested as we give them an access to the world of gaming. And then from the player side, uh, that's something I want to stress, that as a game archive, we do not serve the players. We only serve the game developers. We think it's the game media and the game museum's function to serve the players. And so basically, we, we only open to them through 
exhibitions with art galleries and things like that, but we don't allow them to visit the archive directly. And our, uh, from the industry side, we got tons of support from the industry. And so as a result, uh, 80 of our um, total collection come from donation. And we, we never purchase our collect collection, so everything has been donated. Uh, our challenge would be too many things at a time. And since the time is running relatively quick, I'm just going to going through this slides very quickly, that if we take at, if we take a look at the game industry's picture, that HLA, our game archive would portray ourselves as a Druid's Ark, that what we protect is not only game's history, but also the healthy ecology of the game environment in China. And uh, as mentioned, that we majorly serve two groups. One is game creator and developer, and the other is the public, but not gamers. And um, that's the functions that we can perform for each of the different parties. We do oral history and creator interviews to help them to reflect. We do game referencing, consultation and workshops with the creators. And we also have a standardized knowledge creation process that, that help them to continue to build the trust for game creations. While in terms of the public, we would have open game exhibitions and documentaries, podcasts and public lectures and things like it. And we especially focus on game literacy tools, for example, databases and things like it. I'm running very quickly. And so basically, uh, unlike uh, the game museum or so-called game museums, we serve different function for different interested parties. And here is the point that I really want to make here, that game preservation and game scholarship are extremely difficult in China because of a cultural shackle, that um, there is a Chinese attitude of gaming, that the gentis, the jins, they are um, playing. And th this is one of my uh, 2015 research, which I won't go into details, but only listing the and result here is I did run through games and gamers from the 24th histories, which is a continuous uh, history text database uh, starting from um, before century and then continues until the end of Qing Dynasty, the last imperial dynasty in China. And so in this 4,000 years of history, uh, how were the gamers mentioned and how are the games being referenced? Uh, the end result would be the context for games and gamers are they are either is instrument or jesters, they are tyrants, incapable rulers, they are ill magistrates and psychophants or um, hermits, while the players are psychophants or ill magistrates, servant, concubines, tyrant, or childhood of great men. I mean, from this, you would see that it's a very negative image. It doesn't really. It's, it's not even a neutral image that is building. And so uh, they, they also think play diverted people from the serious real business. And most players ended up being losers for life. And that is uh, that I conclude as Junzi, the, the literati of the Chinese society, the supporting pillar of the society, they are not gamers. And that is why game was never properly recognized by the government. And that is also why um, it is very difficult to get the literatists to, to, to just think seriously about game. So every time we are doing the game literacy lecture series, we will start with this by, uh, by alerting them to realize that they have this cultural ignorance of gaming and they have this, this, this twisted attitude that they never think about rationally. And so with that, this is some of uh, the sol solution that we provided, that we would have game exhibitions in art galleries and in museums, in the proper knowledge house that the public and the literatists would recognize. So we, we are sort of lifting uh, games to a higher cultural level by letting them entering the hall of fame. And so on the basis of that, that on the basis of this, we would also come up with gamification frameworks to help the public, which with no prior game knowledge, to at least could enjoy the, the whole experience. And this is one of the exhibition. I, I won't have time to show you the video, but you could come to me later to see it. 
So, so as you can see, uh, children visit it, and parents bring their children to it. And that's a very rare <laughs> scenario in terms of gaming, because this is the same group of parents that would pledge for the government to stop the game industry entirely every year. And so, um, so, I, so, so this is also part of that exhibition that I won't go, de go into detail. And we also have um, game literacy uh, educational program that built so that we could teach the teachers how to make use of games as, as a toolbox. And then we could uh, go into those uh, secondary schools to teach children how to think critically about games and how to view their own game history and things like it. And basically, um, and we also have a trem tremendous amount of this thing. And this is something I will show very quickly with jumping slides, because it's very important. It's the first game documentary in China, and it sort of brings the, ga <clears throat> the gamers, the developers, to the broader societal issues. Oh, they have some GoPros. Kind of cool. It's not as bad as I thought. How bad could it be? <laughs> no, I thought it was going to be like, shh. Okay, my name is Brian O'Shea. I'm a gamer. When the producers asked me to come host a show in the desert, I thought, what do I know about desert life? Let's go, baby! We are the sand tamers. When I was a kid, uh, so I spent a lot of time playing video games. I think games are amazing, and I'm gonna study how to use them to make the world a better place. You don't want to play a game. Hot pot, hot pot. E R E R. Never met someone who studied gamification before. They're trying to change the world through gaming. My name is Philania Mengfei Liu, and I'm a game scholar. I couldn't possibly imagine that any human being could live without game. 这个和您平时种树或者治沙什么的，您感觉？摔一个沙漠也跌成这个样子就活了。I was trained to be an environmental historian. The core question of this project: Can video games change the world? It is the question that I've been pursuing for over 13 years. 很想看你们的这些创意，准备好了吗？ And what better way to test this theory than bringing two teams of game designers and their KOL consultants to the Chinese desert? They will compete over the next five episodes to see who's able to create games that best communicate the amazing work already done to fight desertification. This project is about when the two worlds collide. That would raise certain challenges for our game designers. 明天上午吧，你们的游戏做成一个可以向他们 this episode, they will pitch their early concepts to the Ningxia locals. 两个月后，我们会回到这儿，给大家都看一下这些游戏最后的版本是怎么样的. Can video games change the world? Yes. So I'm wrapping up really quickly now that on the basis of this, not only did we produce one of the most successful uh, indie game last year, uh, which is my time at Sand Rocks, it, that was developed by one of the team that we bring to the desert, but also we managed to let the public, uh, the normal people, make tons, make games that focusing on the societal issues. We give them workshops and we manage to have uh, the, the fourth grade uh, primary school students which has no gaming experience before and, and no expertise with game development and so ever that they came up with three games after two days and a half uh, workshop. And also uh, the general public produced two digital games that one of them won a Tencent Prize and, and the other uh, one made four board games that, that are all focusing on, on um, the desert and sand control. And so on the basis of this, um, on the basis of this, I can't, I can't get away with this. Okay, so on the basis of this, we 
we, we've done a bunch of things, including oral history and uh, digitizing Chinese game heritage of building a catalog for Chinese game magazines that has never been um, in any site of the libraries in China. And we also have uh, accessible interactive online game histories. And, in, and also we sort of bring the scholars with the developers to have scenarios let, to let them connect. We also have collected efforts through local base uh, that was built with game companies and so that we can help them to solve some problems that would help us to build a healthier game ecology. And I would end here as the functions and the ecological niche that we serve for the industry and for every partners in it and also socially and also for the game academia. Okay, and that is all. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much.